Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Real Talk Office Hours, Hunting for Silver Linings for Friday, May 29, 2020. Hosted today by Corey Hart and George Katsanos, and we have a special guest. We're bringing Luca all the way from Santiago, Chile, to join us on today's program. We are brought to you by Startup Grind, the world's largest startup community with 600 plus chapters in over 125 countries. Startup Grind operates with a mission to educate, inspire, and connect. We are driven by three values, and those are make friends, not contacts, help others before you help yourself, and give before you take. Now, the pandemic has been and will continue to be the great global leveler. And as entrepreneurs, we do our very best for our businesses, our teams, our families, and we need to be informed, rational, analytical, and rigorous in our thinking. We should also learn to control our biases as they emerge in various circumstances. We invite you to join us every fr Monday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday live at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as we track the intersection of facts, these biases, and action through our review of global financial markets alongside check-ins and real talk with Startup Grind chapter directors, entrepreneurs, and ecosystem stakeholders from across the world. Now, nobody has a crystal ball. We can't see the future, but if we keep our eyes and ears open and pay attention, we may be able to see around the bend and with some luck, spot the silver linings that are around every cloud. If you miss the live events, you can view the recordings at startupgrind.com slash grand dash rapids, where you can also download the reading notes from the show that includes all of the details on the startups we talk about with our chapter directors, as well as some key articles that are inform, informing our, uh, our shows. Now, before I introduce George for the global market update, a bit of housekeeping. Comments made and views expressed by all participants in this podcast are not intended to invite or incite individuals, entrepreneurs, or investors to buy or sell financial assets, real assets, commodities, futures, and or options. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform, not to trade or to invest. If you feel compelled to trade and or invest, please call your broker. Remember, however, risk is everywhere, even when you think that you're not taking a risk. Now, with all that, it is now my pleasure to introduce to everyone, George Gutsanos, to get us, get us started with the catch-up of what the global markets are thinking and doing. Thank you, Corey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Talk. As you see from uh, this week's uh, Economist, the two superpowers are competing with um, similar kind of uh, backdrops, uh, dissent, um, pandemic, economic policies, and so on and so forth. And they are competing against each other. Let's start with, um, as we normally do, with uh, currencies. Um, we have seen that the dollar has uh, weakened a little bit, and the reason it has weakened is clearly the um, uh, success of the uh, European coordination. Um, the dollar is trading at about 111 against the euro, about 107, 108 against the yen, 123 against sterling. So with the exception of the euro, for the most part, the currencies are telling us that the policies that the Federal Reserve has been, has been pursuing are still the correct ones. And we'll come to this in a moment. When we look at uh, the bonds, the 10-year bonds in particular, the yields, Japan stuck below zero, just below zero, India at about 5.78%, again, not too far away from uh, Wednesday's close, Sai Korea, similar. So the bond market is telling us uh, in Asia that um, we don't see inflation for the time being, but we are not willing to drop the yields any lower. Similar scenario in Europe. Um, the great, great success stories in the 10-year yield are Greece, Italy, and Spain, the so-called high yielders. Here we see record levels in the yields of the 10-year bonds. Italy is trading under 1.5%, Spain under 0.6%, and Greece under 1.5% on the 10-year bond yield. Again, the reason is investors are looking for return on their investment. The euro is a single currency, and these high yielders will benefit from the stabilization efforts of a new mega 750 billion euro fund. In the United States, the 10-year bond yield is under 0.7%. Canada, again, around 0.5% stable 
Mexico hovering around 6%. The markets do not see any significant inflation yet. That's the picture we get. But at the same time, they are not likely to go any lower. Um, commodities. The commodity picture is, as we discussed uh, um, last uh, Wednesday, dependent on the water for the grains. If the water uh, remains benign, if we don't have any major, major calamities in the Midwest, uh, the crop should be healthy, which means we should have an upward uh, limit to the price of corn, wheat, and soybeans. Um, we're also seeing that the cattle prices are stabilizing on $100 per pound. Gold um, hitting again the upper boundary of the range that we've seen over the last two months, two and a half months. 1749 today, it traded uh, above 1750. Um, Let's see what, uh, what happens here. Something has to give in. Either investors that are, uh, are conscious about inflation will have to cave in, at which point we should see gold prices subside, or uh, this uncertainty about the rest of the financial markets will push away these investors from the safe haven of gold. Copper, as we discussed, is a proxy for manufacturing growth. And the 242, it's trading above previous close in the 230s range. So that is positive. On the energy front, West Texas Intermediate is uh, trading at about $33. Brent is about 34.8, 35. And natural gas at about 1.7 of 1,000 uh, BTUs. The prices haven't fluctuated significantly because the news regarding energy have not changed very much. Um, except, of course, the fact that the National People's Congress in China has decided for the first time that they do not need a growth plan looking ahead. And we discussed that on Wednesday. Equity markets. If you look at the equity markets, you will see that Asia, for the most part, whether it was uh, Karachi, Singapore, the Bombay Stock Exchange, the Nifty 50, um, were in the green. They closed in the green this week. And the reason is, of course, um, global recovery prospects. China, on the other hand, um, has been somewhat tepid. The Hang Seng, the Hong, so Hong Kong uh, Stock Exchange Index, was down 0.7%, understandably. When we look at the Nikkei, uh, nothing has changed in Japan, not a major change. Whereas in Europe, we had uh, a sudden reversal. There has been a little bit of selling across the major indices from Belgium, Austria, um, Switzerland, um, Amsterdam, Spain, 1.8% uh, down, France, 1.6%, the UK, 2.3%. Um, and of course, the reason here is growth and the resurgence of the pandemic after the reduction in lockdown practices. As we speak, the Dow is down 0.85%, the S&P down half a percent, and NASDAQ is just above water. Um, it is worth noting here that the overall um, sentiment is anchored on the success of the um, recovery process. In um, the US, we have a couple of data points that are worth taking into consideration. One is that every single worker has COVID at one US farm on the eve of harvest. We're beginning to har have harvest here in the Northern Hemisphere um, and with weak workers, we're going to have issues on the supply chain. Farm workers are getting sick and spreading the illness just as the US heads into the peak of the summer product season. In all likelihood, the cases will keep climbing as more than half a million seasonal employees crowd onto buses to move among farms across the country and get housed together in cramped bunkhouse style dormitories. The second point worth mentioning is that there's a lot of introspection in New York about why New York suffered more when other cities did not suffer as badly from the COVID-19. And as uh, Mr. Salmon, Dr. Salmon said, the director of the climate and health program at Columbia University's Mayo School of Public Health, 
there has been there has been there's a lot of blame to go all around. We haven't been confronted with an infectious disease like this for a hundred years. To summarize, there is five reasons that Bloomberg journalists identified in discussions with experts and interviews with experts over the last few days. One, although the closed door policy, in other words, the restrictions on air travel were imposed immediately by this administration, the back door was open. In other words, studies show that Southeast Asian origin of the virus affected the west coast of the United States, around San Francisco and so on and so forth, whereas the virus with Italian footprints affected New York. The second major factor for um, the uh, spread of the virus in New York was the slowness of the authorities to recommend that people do not use public transport. As late as March 2nd, the New York City Health Commissioner, Oxuris Barbot, had said that we want New Yorkers to go about their daily lives, ride the subway, take the bus, go see your neighbors. That was wrong. Three, perfect environment. New York was and, and remained a, a city of shared spaces, whether it was art galleries, restaurants, museums, or colleges and universities, concert halls. This was a perfect environment for the virus to spread. Social distancing, in other words, was not something that New, York's were prepared, New Yorkers were prepared to do. Slowness to close was the fourth factor. The New York leaders were slow in shutting down the city. Finally, the nursing homes. It is clear that there have been 5,980 presumed and confirmed COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes and adult care facilities as of May 24. New York State did not take adequate measures to protect these areas. The result, as Dr. Salmon said, we failed on both ends. We disrupted the economy and haven't controlled the disease. Um, in uh, our notes, and I'll stop here, you will see um, quite a few articles today about um, how deeply the coronavirus changed our behavior. We also have uh, articles about um, today's news that consumer prices rose by 0.5%, the lowest pace since 1961. Consumer spending fell a record 13.6% in April, is another piece of news. Israel is recording spikes in coronavirus cases to 101. We just had a, um, an interview of the health ministry about an hour, an hour and a half ago. Clearly, the reduction in lockdown is having effects. The second wave is here, and it's a reality. As uh, we're heading into the weekend, you will receive from us a um, weekend reading list of articles that we've assembled. However, there's one article that I would like you to focus and I would like you to think about. The Federal Reserve ramps up deliberations on asset purchases and rate guidance. On June 9th and on June 10th, the Federal Reserve will hold its monthly meeting, the policy meeting, where we expect and the market expect that a lot of the groundwood will be laid to reset the U.S. economy, but also the global coordination. Not only we expect that the Federal Reserve will mention something about interest rate policy, but also we expect yield cups. In other words, the Federal Reserve may start pursuing policies that we've seen elsewhere of capping the rate of interest that bonds and different maturities of these bonds will be trading it with a view to reducing the cost of refinancing these huge expenses. In other words, what it seems to be happening is that certainly Congress will pass a major stimulus package. Certainly we will see more intervention by the Federal Reserve. And with that, we will see higher, greater 
levels of international coordination of central banks. That means, for a simple reader like myself, that all is not well. I would like to close this part of our presentation by looking at um, the um, if you allow me for a second to find the latest article in um, in uh, Bloomberg, but we can do that another time. Thank you, Corey. Great, thank you so much, George. That's, uh, that, this is a, a pretty comprehensive and large uh, group of notes here. It's probably our largest to date so far. I did notice something in there speaking about the uh, uh, women and gender equity uh, issues that uh, we're starting to see. There's already an equity grab, and uh, that is a risk certainly, but then as we always know, and as we talk about here, there are those silver linings and opportunities on the other side of risk. Interesting point. Enough, Sorry, Corey, the point yeah. about women is that um, women are disproportionately represented in all mm -hmm. of these professions that have suffered because of the corona crisis, from nurses mm -hmm. to um, restaurant bartenders, servers, and so on and so forth. Women have been disproportionately represented. And the gender roles that they are um, assigned back at home also. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's... Uh, I, I was just doing a bunch of uh, research ahead of uh, what we have in June for Startup Grind is uh, Startup Grind uh, Women's Month in, uh, in the month of June. And uh, that's something that we'll be talking about with Luca, especially uh, because uh, I did find that uh, there are some really great programming from the government uh, to encourage uh, female founders, especially like in that uh, startup ecosystem. But um, we'll get to that. First, I just want to get to the introduction. I want to bring uh, Luca into the conversation. Uh, hello, Luca. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Corey, uh, for the opportunity. It's great to be part of this. Yeah, and uh, and first, maybe a, a quick little introduction uh, from yourself. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you're Venezuelan, and then also you are a founder yourself. Yeah, so, well, I was born in, in Merida, Venezuela, in a um, university student city. Um, I graduate I, myself as economist, and because the situation in Venezuela, I decided to escape from the dictatorship and and then I went to Argentina and then I partnered with some American from California from San Diego and we built uh, we found um, we created a startup called Prosper Points and that's how my entrepreneur entrepreneurial journey started here in Santiago de Chile and uh, well now, now I'm doing different things first I'm chapter director of Santiago de Ch uh, Chile in the startup grind um, she's chief innovation officer of the startup of my investor, and also I'm the founder and COO of Prosper Points, which is in my startup. So I'm doing a lot of things, and I have a lot of uh, passion, and I'm a purebred entrepreneur. That's how I like. I love to call myself. So yeah. Now, yeah, something that we usually say is like, yeah, that entrepreneurism is uh, it's it's addictive, and then it's also viral, right? Wow. Yes. I mean, it's. If you start, if you, I mean, I never had uh, experience in the corp uh, uh, in the industries. I never worked for anybody. Um, uh, so if you start as an entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's a journey. It's so, you have a lot of ups and downs. And that's, that's like you feel that without that, you're not going to feel yourself alive after. So right. sometimes you think like, what happens if I fail or if I get bored and I want to work for another person in a big company? I'm going to feel the same? I don't know. So, yeah, it's <laughs> very addictive. I think uh, those ups and downs, we we get like sometimes 10 of those a day, right? Like, <laughs> day, Yeah, it's crazy. The same day you can be like pretty high, like, wow, I closed this client. Then other client call you like, no, I'm out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And you then see. the website is down and yeah, uh, the website like, is down <laughs> or, or some user in your app is like uh, complaining about something. Wow. It's, it's crazy. But <laughs> you love the process. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, you, you, if you're a human being, whatever you do, whatever you, you, you decide to do, you have to love the process. And where you are an entrepreneur or when you're a doctor, you have to fall in love on, on the process of, of your journey. So that's important. 
That's a, that's a really important point though. And, and we do land on process a little bit later um, in the conversation. So you have um, a lot of real world first person experience. Um, you're, you're across a lot of different borders, uh, interaction with uh, like the US with your firm. That's a lot to bring to bear as chapter director of Startup Grind in, in Santiago there. So uh, what, what made you, uh, uh, dis- how did you discover the Startup Grind community and what made you start your own chapter there? Yeah, so starting as an entrepreneur in a new, in a different country was super hard for me and to my, for my partner. He was from California, I was from Venezuela. We, um, we were like new people trying to meet people to have contacts. And then just by, by luck, somebody told me there is a, a community called Startup Grind. They have some events. You should go there and connect with people. Okay, I will try it and then go. I, I met the past director, uh, Ricardo Silva. I saw like how welcome and warm was the community there, you know, like the, the whole passion about connecting and helping entrepreneurs. So I started using Startup Grind uh, as my own hub so I can know people, investors, and potential clients or potential investors or potential uh, partners, you know. And just by chance, uh, I create a relationship with Ricardo. I offer, I always offer him like value and support, like whatever you need from me, I want to collaborate. And then he offered me the, the opportunity to be a director because he has, uh, he had some uh, health situations and needed support. And I took the responsibility of being a chapter director. And that's how I started this, this journey. So you, uh, you had an established community to, to help uh, to move forward. Yeah. And uh, that's really great. So um, <clears throat> uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the people in your Startup Grind community there that are doing some pretty fun things, uh, some exciting things? Yeah, there is, Chile is a great entrepreneurship ecosystem. Uh, there is a lot of people doing great things. Also, we have uh, this in June is the female uh, month. And we have a entrepren- uh, female entrepreneur who is a, she's a rock star. She have like five ad seats and he's like, um, he's building robots to take to the space. And she's partnering with some other startup. He's building a robot with a 3D printer. So they can start and go to the space and print their own, the tools and everything they need in, instead of trans, uh, transporting the, the tools and everything they need from the, from the herd. Mm-hmm. So it's crazy what she's doing. And I think she's, the, I asked her to be my mentor, so that's great. Uh, now she's my new mentor, but I think that what she's doing is awesome. Uh, I mean, she's helping a lot. I mean, they're trying to build some, uh, something very disruptive and helpful, and she's supported by NASA too. So it's pretty great. And she's Chilean. She was born here, so everything started here. And there is a, I mean, the, the strong part of the uh, Chilean entrepreneur, eco, entrepreneurship ecosystem is that the government have a strong support for startups. There is a lot of grants. And if you are an entrepreneur and you're just starting and you have an idea, uh, there is a, the government is taking a lot of risk if you want to start your business. Mm-hmm. So that's a strong part. And other th- cool things that's happening, I, I know some, a new VC fund called Webus.vc. That I think that they have the best investor here in Chile. I, I, I really admire that guy. He has a lot of expertise and he's very kind with entrepreneurs and the startup founders. And he's trying to, uh, to fund a group, of, uh, to invest in a group of startups that are trying to disrupt everything. This, um, uh, like, he's trying to invest in startups that are trying to solve big problems inside LATAM, but trying to connect them through the ecosystem in the United States. So it's pretty crazy and interesting what he's doing right now in Santiago de Chile. And I think there is a lot of startup. There is a lot of talent here. Chile is a small market. So that all the startups here and entrepreneurs are trying to start here, validate the problem and the idea and there to move big to other countries, United States, Brazil, and Argentina. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, you bring up an interesting point. So so it's a good spot to land and, uh, and, and get something started. And there, does it still exist where you can get uh, like, a, like a visa in just 15 days? Um, I think, for example, if you have, for example, I'm part of the Startup Chile program, which is uh, sponsored by the government, Corfo. And yes, if you get uh, selected in that program, you can have a visa pretty quick. 
So you have to like to be selected in, the, in some of these programs with the different incubators or accelerator in order to have a quick visa, okay? Mm -hmm. But also you can, you can come over to the country as a tourist and then you can change your status, okay? So I, I think uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you try to provide value to the country, it's very easy to find uh, your visa, so yes. Sure. So as, a, as an entrepreneur, tech talent, or investor, you can, you can land, uh, yeah. get some traction uh, pretty easily. And, it's, and I found that the Global Innovation Index uh, marks like Chile is the first in Latin America for innovation. So that's then, like you just said, you could, uh, you could then cross borders into other Latin American countries. That's pretty yeah. popular then, huh? Yeah. Um, that's really great. Um, so uh, when you, uh, like your events in, um, in, in Chile for the startup grind, you had to pivot to, to virtual and whatnot. Have you found this uh, being a pretty, uh, pretty good opportunity to expand your network? Yeah, I mean, uh, every, every change has the, the, his own pros and cons. Uh, yeah, give me a second. I'm sorry, I was uh. some noise before, uh, behind. Um, so I find that, um, I, I think that the online events are uh, even uh, great in order to expand yourself a little bit more, but you you lose you kind of lose that uh, interaction between the human beings, you know, like networking space and the conversations and the networking. So we started with Zoom events, our first three webinars. Uh, we had a lot of uh, attendees, like between 80 and 120 attendees. But yesterday we had a webinar in a new platform called Remo. And when you go to the platform, you have the opportunity to do networking because you can uh, log in, in different tables. And when you log into the tables, you have uh, you can talk only with the people you sit, that I set down in your tables. So that helped a lot in, in order to do networking. People were pretty happy. So in this moment, I think that, uh, I mean, it's good to have the online webinars, but I would like in the future to have a mix between the online webinars and the personal events because personal events are, are better in order to interact between human beings. Yeah, so we're finding that uh, the, this uh, switch to virtual um, is, is an opportunity for different people in different regions to find more collaboration. So there are partnerships across geographies that uh, are coming about that previously just would not have come to mind. Um, is that, is there more, do you feel that there might be more collaboration uh, between countries down there, um, you know, in, in Latin America? Yes, absolutely. Actually, I have a meeting soon with the LATAM uh, director of Startup Grind. They're going to build, um, you know, like a LATAM uh, conference and we're going to work together, we all, in order to bring the best speakers possible, sponsors and investors to, to be part of this. And also, I remember I was invited to the Startup Grind Italy. I had like a live video stream too. So I think it's a great opportunity for, all, for everyone in the world to connect. And I think it's great because I think that different countries have different strengths and different weaknesses. And we can support each other in order to, to connect and to bring to the entrepreneurs different opportunities and better opportunities. So I'm pretty happy that I can, for example, I can just call someone in California or in, you know, in Europe and try to connect the chapters and try to provide a lot of value to the entrepreneurs, okay? So it's, I think it's great. Now, on, the, on that topic of uh, providing, providing value to entrepreneurs, um, what, uh, what kind of resources are, are people joining your ecosystem to find? Is it, uh, are they hungry for um, talent? Are they hungry for money? Are they looking for investors? Are they looking for, um, like advice around any kind of bureaucracy, even though that I'm reading that you don't have a lot of bureaucracy down there for startups? I mean, we have, I, in our community here in Santiago, we see a lot of people tr uh, with an idea that doesn't know how to start. I would say that 40% of 50% of the, our attendees are people that are not sure about quitting his job and starting his journey as a startup founder. So, in that case, we always try to bring speakers that can uh, give a soft landing or expertise as a soft landing for this guy to, you know, to do the leap of faith. Uh, so, uh, in that case, I mean, um, we, we, we surround ourselves, our events of these people, and we invite a lot of investors, and we invite a lot of startup founders to be part of the uh, attendee situation. 
So they can help these people, these young entrepreneurs that are trying to start, or they're just starting. Uh, that's like the 45 or 50% of our att attendees. But also we have a lot of, um, uh, in, in, there's a situation in LATAM, but in, in, uh, in, Ch in Chile as well. Yes, the government support you. The government is going to uh, take the risk on your startup. But after you graduate for, from your accelerator program or your incubator program, if you, if you didn't accomplish like uh, a lot of sales in order to be self-sufficient uh, with your startup, you're almost dead because there is no angel investor. The reason why I'm still alive is because I have an angel investor from the United States. Okay. And so what's happened, people go to a startup grind as an ecosystem where they can they want to connect with the best uh, investors that they can find in this city, but also to have the opportunity to connect with investors in the United States. Because here there is a lot of investors, they, they love to call, call themselves like angel investor, or I am a VC, but they're not. They're like in the, another world and they, they're trying to navigate this, uh, you know, like a business to see how they can start, but they don't like the risk. The Latin, the Latin American investor, they don't like risk, uh, they are more secure. So it's hard to find, super hard for an entrepreneur, even if you have a lot of traction to find an invest, a local investor. That's so really I would say that. That's yeah. really interesting that you say that, that you have almost half of your people attending, like uh, eager to take a leap and risk on the startup side, the founder side, but on the investment side, it's so risk averse. Um, I was also reading that the strength of big business in Chile is so strong that it kind of maybe suffocates or there's not a, it prevents there being a lot of room for the startups to like really have a chance. Is that part of the issue as well? Yeah, so it, here in Chile happens different things. First, it's a small market. Second, it's kind of a close market. You, you need to know people in order to, to, to create something here, right? And also huge big companies uh, like, like you mentioned, have a lot of, uh, I will not say uh, power, but I will say that they have, uh, every industry is like lead by some big companies, um, big holdings, so it's hard. But the government through SCORFO and this start uh, program that they have, they're pushing or putting pressure in these companies in order to support uh, entrepreneurs and startups. So what's happening, currently happening here in Chile is that if you have, if you want actually to get some traction, you have to build a B2B startup. So these uh, incubators and these accelerators will ask you to create a B2B business model so you can uh, build your solution based on the needs of the companies. So right now it's kind of starting this collaboration between the, the big companies and the startups and that's giving some oxygen, okay? Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of bureaucracy in order to make that happen. For example, I just pivot my, my startup from a B2C model for, for a B2B. That's how I got selected to this startup uh, Chile program. And uh, in order to have my first client, uh, it, it, will, uh, it's, it takes a lot of time. I mean, people have a lot of bureaucracy. You start speaking with HR, then you have to go to operation, but operation have something different. And it can take like six months or one year in order to have the first, uh, uh, you know, like the first invoice. You can create the first invoice after six, eight months, and it takes a lot of time. So it's complicated. But I think that the government and the um, uh, accelerator programs are working hard in order to create this um, connection between the big companies so they can support st startups and they can, valid they can validate their idea, have proof of concept, some traction, and go to the other markets. That's really great. Uh, I think you've given us a pretty, uh, pretty good picture of the ecosystem there. George, uh, do you have any, uh, any questions for, for Luca here? First of all, I would like to thank him for giving us uh, a wonderful perspective, but also picture of uh, Chile. Um, the fact that you started as an immigrant and you became part of this global diaspora of um, entrepreneurs, I think is very important because what you have seen is the difference in national perspective. But also you have seen how positive the recipient country can be in helping with a small nudge of policies, young brains who want to contribute to the society where we are. 
Because at the end of the day, one of the reasons we all become entrepreneurs is because we want to give back. We want to share the knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, to me, it is interesting that compared, for instance, to Vancouver and Henry's um, wonderful infrastructure, where you actually see the state, the local government, the federal government, you have angel investors, you have the banks, you have um, venture capital groups, you have private equity groups, and so on and so forth. It seems to me that in Santiago, you have essentially friends and family who are the main investors in most of these ideas. Yeah, I mean, there, I think that um, the Chilean uh, uh, startup ecosystem is, is new, but they are pretty uh, solid on the support they're trying to give. But I think that there is a lot of entrepreneurs around the world and investors that came over here and they try to convince the family offices and try to convince angel investors or, or people with uh, a lot of uh, capital to start investing in this ecosystem. But without the government, it will be almost uh, impossible, okay? So the government is the guy taking risk, and there is a lot of people working hard, very hard, because I know these people trying to convince, to convince these other parts of the, uh, the ecosystem that it's needed, like family and, friend, uh, family and office, and VCs, um, angels, to try to, be, to push hard in the startup ecosystem. But there is a lot of money in, in here. In Chile, is one of the best markets in LATAM. Is it the more stable market? Uh, there is. It's a. It's a beautiful market. That's the reason why my partner come over here from California to Chile. Okay, and the startup ecosystem here in Chile is the best startup ecosystem in LATAM. I mean, Brazil is bigger, but you can find. Uh, you can as an investor, you will have more. Um, you can conf trust more in the in this market. Okay, but yes, I will say that. There is a lot of people working hard, but there is a lot of, uh, I, th I think that family offices uh, are trying to, you know, to go and try to invest in the startup ecosystem, but they're trying to understand how this works because they're so used to the, um, to the old school uh, version of investing. You know, like if I invest in something in one year, I want to see that that startup is already self-efficient or self, um, you know, I, I, I have some ROI, I have some, uh, uh, be a lot of revenue, he can stand by his own, I don't need, he's not, he's not going to need more cash. So in this startup world, it's different. Sometimes you can, in the first two, three, four years, you can be in, in red, okay? So there is a, a lot of huge and awesome ideas that investors from the United States are supporting and they're taking the money back from uh, to United States and people here is not taking those opportunities because it's new, because it's different. So I think it's about time. I, it's, it's about time. I think that in five years, everything is going to be different, but also it's great. There is some, uh, um, there is some uh, uh, people here that are actually doing some great, uh, great things for entrepreneurs and taking them to different countries so, to, so they can make something big. Yeah, that's, uh, we were speaking with, uh, the chapter director Modu over there in the Gambia, and he was speaking about mindset um, of, you know, the generational mindset being maybe uh, preventing some people from taking those leaps, uh, especially on, on the investor side. Um, but then also the importance on leaning on uh, solving the, this whole problem as a region. Um, now, uh, you had mentioned that you have uh, uh, a really great speaker for SG Women uh, this in June. It's June. Uh, she's, her name is uh, Carla Mutoni. I told you she's a rock star. Mm -hmm. I convinced her to be my mentor. And she's doing something great. She sold like two restaurants, two startups. And I know that she has another exit. And she's helping a lot. I'm very strong for, uh, to the woman, uh, women startup ecosystem. He told me that I'm going to be the first male mentee that she's going to have. So... <laughs> And um, yeah, I really admire her, and I want to I want to bring her also to uh, to global startup grind uh, events because I think that the world needs to know what she's doing and how she, how big she's supporting to the ecosystem and her mindset. Like you mentioned, I think that being an entrepreneur or the fact that you're going to have an ecosystem is about building a mindset, mm -hmm. you know. And she, she have the mindset. And she's helping a lot of people through their her mindset to build a mindset because it's not easy. Not everyone have their their like 
yeah, the mindset, but the personality in order to be an entrepreneur. It's, it's, it's a cultural thing. In the United States, it's something big. People want to be entrepreneurs. People want to make big things. When Latam is like, most people is kind of afraid. Well, maybe I should not do big things. Maybe I should not create things. That's another topic, but yes. Sure. I think Carla is leading something great and she's working with NASA. She's part of Singularity University and she's a rock star. Yes, I admire her a lot. Well, you brought up a uh, university there. That's something that something we like to ask about is uh, what kind of support is there for the ecosystem in in the university system or education system? Uh, well, I think that they, they're starting to to realize that this war maybe is going more to the startup side. I think that if you're a university, you it's a complicated situation right now for universities in Latam. I mean. I think that because um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and all these technologies, uh, I think that every year it's going to be hard to find these traditional jobs with the traditional uh, mm, degrees that you can have. So I think that they're starting, but for my experience, I start my, my, the first version of my startup. Uh, we wanted to sell uh, the product to the universities and they never support us. We knock every door in this country and they never support a product that actually increase the, the concentration and the um, productivity and the grade from the, their students. So not because they're bad, uh, like because they don't want to support, but because they have a lot of bureaucracies and they don't understand the start of work. So I think that in the, from my perspective, and I can be wrong, I think there is too, it's a new war for them. It's too new for them, okay? Look, uh, just a quick question on this one. Here in the US, you have very often business schools, professors in business schools who become investors, who are yeah. actually, if we see themselves not only as teaching what it means to be an entrepreneur, what it means to be a risk and so on, but they actually put their own money at risk. Is that not happening in Santiago? Well, I, I'm not Chilean and I mean, I've been here for three years. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that the uh, university professor here doesn't earn a lot of money. So the fact that they don't have, uh, you know, they cannot save a lot of money and the fact that it's a different culture, I don't think there is a lot of professors or university teachers that are actually invest in the startups. I, what, what I found is that there is a lot of uh, startup founders that have a lot of expertise that they teach in universities, uh, you know, link canvas, entrepreneurship and different things, and they do invest on startups. That's what I have seen here in Santiago de Chile, and that's what's currently happening. But I, I don't see teachers or, or professors investing. I know there is some uh, universities that they have their own programs and incubators, and they, they, they are just starting, but they support startups the money that they invest in the startups is the Chilean government money. So they use that money and they select the startups, but they never take, they never take money from their own pocket. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're coming up on the, on the end of our time here. Um, <clears throat> I do, we do like to ask if there's a, like, what, uh, what do you, what do you need? Um, and maybe start, whether it's for your startup grind chapter or maybe in your, um, in your entrepreneurial career, uh, like you found uh, another great mentor, that's awesome. For your startup, is there is there anything that the international community, especially the startup grind community, can can do for you? Well, um, for the startup grind band, we want we, we really want to connect the United States ecosystem with Chile with the Chilean ecosystem, because I think that the American expertise can help to the can help to the people here that have a lot of money and can invest in startup to understand how the uh, investment process works and why they're, they, they're taking the risk, okay? And also the fact that, the, that we can find some people from United States that can support or can invest or can mentors, uh, do some mentorships to the, event, uh, to the startup here, it's going to the startups here, sorry, it's going to create some sense of FOMO, right? That, okay, <laughs> The, the, these gringos are taking our money. I don't know. <laughs> it's just a, a fun way to say it. And then and they're going to start, okay, yeah, uh, okay, let's wait a minute. Let's talk with these people. Let's connect. Let's learn more because we need to support our ecosystem because, for
for example, I remember the, the biggest exit here in Chile was with a company called Corner Shop that uh, Uber uh, bought, bought for $300 million around that. And almost the only people, the only Chileans were the founders, but the investors are from Mexico, uh, family and friends of the Chileans, but no uh, special investor took the risk from that. You know, mm -hmm. and, United, and they have some investor from the United States. So also with another start here that is pretty famous, they was supported by Y Combinator. So the money is not the investors, the, I mean the, the ROI and the profits, uh, people from the outside is taking that profit. And they have to, it's not bad, but right. people need to understand that they have to take some risk and they need to understand the investment process. And maybe you're going to fail with seven startups but three of them are going to pay your investment or your risk or whatever. Every VC have a different uh, situation and different uh, algorithm or you know decision making strategies. But I think that FOMO is the word. We have to create some FOMO here, connect the, the American ecosystem with the Latin ecosystem, try to support and, and grow. And then with that, inspire other startups or potential founders or potential clients to, okay, we need to pay attention to this because that's where the world is going. Yeah, the, the FOMO is really key as far as, yeah, seeing that money go outside of the country, but then when you're able to create that in country, um, I know we have a lack in the, in the Midwest part of the US here where George and I are. Um, we just have a, a lack of knowing somebody else who's done it. Yeah. And those stories aren't told enough. Um, okay. so that if, uh, so once, uh, once you do have somebody who's brave enough down there in, in Santiago or in Chile to like do that investment, have a couple, like say 10, 20 investments and have one do really well and all the other ones tank like miserably, um, uh, they're still able to say, yeah, I have 20 failures, but this one success, that was $300 million. Yeah, um, exactly. and then that person can tell 20 people and they're like, well, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, one of the questions I like to ask uh, towards the end is uh, what's, what's one of the main or most common pieces of advice you find yourself um, giving uh, your community? Uh, because in, this, in these times right now where there's a lot of uncertainty, I'm sure your email is blowing up. I'm sure your phone is going crazy. People are asking you because you are the mayor of your entrepreneurial city there. Um, you know, what, what, what kind of advice are you giving out a lot? Well, our, these moments are very complex. Everyone is facing different situations. But I, I, I will say like first, my first advice for people is like, you, you need to discover who you are because I see a lot of people trying to be entrepreneurs and they are not. And being whatever you want to be in this life, if you don't like it, you're going to suffer a lot. And being entrepreneurs, like you say, is like, it's so complicated that Please, in, even, even worse in this moment, if you decide to try to be an entrepreneur or to create your own thing, try to know that who you are. If you are really an entrepreneur, you really have the, you know, like the mindset and you're going to go all in with that, do it. But if you have something different in yourself, try to look and to test different things where you can support another startup, another entrepreneurs or other uh, things in this world. My second advice will be like, this moment, you have to be very smart, okay? Uh, and realize what, what is my current situation. And if you are kind of stuck and you're facing a complicated, uh, for example, you lost your job or your lost clients for in my, uh, in my, I lost some clients. So whatever your situation are, you have to invest time in order to solve your problem. People lose a lot of time in Netflix and playing, you know, like Xbox, Dude, this is the moment where you're at home and you have a computer and you have a phone and you can, everything my, my, happens today, whatever, whatever you can learn, whatever you can do, whatever you can, you want to make reality. This is the moment because you have the time and you have the tools. So 30 years ago, my father, for example, have to go to a, to a bookstore and buy a book and read the book and make a resume and learn something. It's hard, but now, right now, you can make a, a free online course where you can learn whatever. So this is the moment where you have to learn, figure out what you love, and try to go all in on that. That's my biggest advice today. Yeah, it's uh, remarkable how like that Y Combinator, it's free. Startup school is free. 
Yeah. You know, they <laughs> and they, they have a lot. Yeah. They have cohorts of 15,000 people at a time or startups at a time. Yeah. It's really remarkable what's out there. Uh, George, any, uh, any final uh, or last uh, questions, comments for Luca? Um, we have not touched on the issue of valuation and uh, you're entering uh, winter, which means um, obviously travel is going to get even tighter, more difficult. Where do you see the valuations of startups going from here in Chile? Wow, it's, it's a complex question because it depends of the industry that that startup is uh, working right now because there is a lot of companies that still have a lot of uh, power right now, even with the situation, sorry. Uh, I would say that most of the startups are, are seeing a decrease on their valuation. That's for sure, okay? Uh, we cannot deny that. But also there is some industries that is, is, are getting bigger right now because of the situation. And there's, because like I mentioned you, there are a lot of, uh, if you want to survive here in Chile, you need to build a B2B business model. And if you, you as entrepreneur, as a startup, are selling your product to a company, they have your, they have, uh, they see in an industry that is growing in this moment, obviously you're going to see the devaluation of your startup grow. But you need to be, I think that the, the you, you need to be pretty smart on how you pivot, on how you, um, you spend your money. You need to be smart in these things. How you spend your money? Uh, who and uh, who are you hiring? The hiring is super important right now because it's so complex. And if you're going to, you need to start testing different uh, new re uh, revenue streams. You know, regardless, regardless the your your um, uh, your market or your industry, you need to start uh, testing new things because the world is not going to be the same. And I think that if you keep uh, uh, those things uh, in mind, I think you're going to be able to keep your valuation or to try to grow it once this uh, complex situation ends or establish a little bit more. But for sure, the most of the startups, we, we lose uh, a lot of um, our valuation decrease a lot. For example, mine decrease, my valuation decrease. And the last round that we closed uh, was below the, the previous round. So, it, and we did it because we need to keep ourselves alive. And how did the uh, previous investors uh, take this reduction in valuation? Uh, I only have, I have one angel investor in my startup and I have a new, like as a smart capital investor. That's the first time he's putting money, okay? So they didn't like it a lot. But in this situation, it was a small round to keep the operations open. And we all were agree, we are small. We just pivoted uh, from previous uh, version that we had. And we all agreed that our main goal is to keep this alive, to try to make the small moves that we need in order to survive. And also that we have a lot of potential, so we need to make the risk. So it was something that we all had, were, uh, um, we all agree on. So. It, but it's a different situation. There is a lot of people that have different investors and if the, they're going to raise a different, um, an extra uh, investment round, maybe they're going to have a lot of problem in order to decrease their valuation. Who knows what's going to happen there? But I see a lot of startups that are closing their, their businesses because of that conflict between their, their investors. And also here, the incubators, some incubators take equity from you with, and they give you the Chilean government grant and they take like 7% and with, I don't know, the, I think it's like around 60 or 70 grand, uh, US dollar, 70,000 US dollar. And then an investor come over and put more money. And also they have like a complicated situation between the equity that the incubator have and the equity that the investor have. So I think that that's something that people have to, uh, the government and the investor have to think about how to solve that situation. But yes, that, that's my perspective. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's that must have been a, a pretty dis difficult decision conversation to have as you're trying to you know just uh, keep keep the lights on you know uh, yeah. keep the wheels from falling off all the different uh, you know analogies there. But uh, anyway, um, thank you so much for your time. Really yeah. appreciate. Really really gracious um, of you to to. <clears throat> To, to be with us here today and, and, and enlighten us on what's going on in your, in your home there. 
Yeah, no, thank you guys. For me, it's a great opportunity. I'm learning a lot. I really respect what you're doing here. It's very organized. I want you to be in touch so I can learn from you from the markets and everything. And also it's an opportunity for me to speak English. I'm learning too. So. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for the opportunity and let's be in touch and maybe we can build something together and connect and make things, big things happen. Hopefully I see you in the next global event of Start Grind. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, next February. It'd be great if we can do that in person. Um, I, I, it's a long dream of mine to be down there in Santiago, you know, and then obviously, uh, um, you know, I want to go climb the mountains and it's a great gateway. Uh, the Chilean wines are incredible. I'm a big, big fan of uh, the cuisine and the wine and the, all that stuff that you guys have. So, um, yeah, uh, we're going to be sending out an email to you uh, every monthly, sort of a catch up, uh, sort of be like, hey, some of them are open in questions, but we're really going to just start taking the temperature on uh, these ecosystems that we're checking in on sort of like, hey, things looking up neutral or down, you know, right. um, and then we'll push that information out to everybody. Um, and yeah, just really thrilled to have this global conversation with everyone. Um, George, any final thanks from you before we let Luca go? Luca, thank you for the time. It is impressive what you have achieved within three years. For some entrepreneurs, it takes far longer. And it seems to me that you have managed to um, traverse uh, both the um, Latin American perspective, but also the U.S. perspective. Um, I think um, we look forward to having you here if you decide to come to the U.S. anytime in uh, Grand Rapids here at the beginning of the Great Prairie. And uh, if we can be of uh, any help, uh, let us know. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, you too. Um, I really love this opportunity. And I think that if you guys want to come over here in Chile, let me know. My, my doors are open. I will help you guys. And I will introduce you to the whole country if you want. <laughs> That's great. Cool. All right. Um, we're going to say goodbye to Luca. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh, you can always catch the recordings at startupgrind.com. And uh, we're going to, we have a lot of reading for you over the weekend to get caught up on what's going on in world events. Next episode is on Monday and then we continue every Wednesday and Friday. That's 1 PM Eastern standard time. Uh, thanks so much, Luca. 